Good evening and welcome to the Bowie State uh, University Graduate Student Association COVID-19 Virtual Town Hall. We are ready today with a wealth of information for our Bowie State community, as well as the community at large. And to kick us off, we have the Bowie State President, Dr. Amitra Bro. My name is Aminta Bro, and I'm the very proud 10th president at Bowie State University. And it is indeed my honor and pleasure to welcome you on behalf of our more than 6,200 students and the entire campus community to this COVID-19 virtual town hall sponsored by the Bowie State University Graduate Student Association. I'd like to thank Mr. Michael McGee, president of the Graduate Student Association for his leadership and to the entire Graduate Student Association and our student body for persisting and staying focused on your education, especially during these continued challenging times. As the first HBCU in the state of Maryland, our history has included many challenges, trials, and tribulations, and yet we have remained true to our cause in ensuring higher education for generations and staying focused on finding the pathways for our youth to achieve their education. With the two crises of the pandemic and the challenges of social injustice and the intersection of the two, we know that we must continue to stay vigilant if BSU is to achieve our mission of access and affordability to a quality educational experience and ensuring our graduates continue to achieve success. And so I want to thank the GSA, our moderator and panelists for your participation in the program this evening and addressing the all important issues related to the pandemic and ensuring that we as one community find the means to better health, economics, and social prosperity and equity. I wish you all continued good health and invite you to the campus when it is safe to do so. Please come on out to Bowie State University in beautiful Prince George's County, Maryland. Thank you and enjoy the program. Well, we see that David is having a few technical challenges. David, if you can unmute, then we will be able to hear you. There you go. Now we're ready to proceed. Okay, it appears we are having a few technical difficulties. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue to move right along. I wanna first start by introducing our fantastic panel. Um, and as we do, we'll bring them right on up to the screen. We'll start with, in no particular order, um, we have Dr. Jackson joining us. Welcome, Dr. Jackson. Dr. Purnell joining us. Welcome, Dr. Purnell. We have Dr. Jordan joining us, Jordan Alston joining us. Thank you, um, Dr. Jordan Alston. We have Dr. Um, Nadazi joining us. Thank you, Dr. Nadazi. I apologize, Dr. Nadazi joining us. And we also have joining us, 
Dr. Stanley. Welcome all the doctors in the building. It's so great to have you. Um, today's discussion will be set up as a sobering look at the numbers, deaths unfortunately in particular, although not as many people are dying as the nation experienced a month ago. One death is too many though. We all know someone unfortunately who has passed from COVID, um, who has experienced COVID, um, and we understand that the reams of COVID information that are generated daily over and over and over again. But many African-Americans are getting misinformation from social media sites or from word of mouth rumors, all of which are bad. And also joining us is Dr. Hill. Welcome, Dr. Hill. Um, we're going to kick this discussion off um, with a few words from Dr. Purnell, who's gonna provide us just a quick explanation of what COVID is and explain why the vaccines are safe and necessary, particularly with the advent of B117 variant from the UK and other mutations from South Africa and Brazil. But before we get to Dr. Purnell, who's gonna give us the breakdown, we wanna roll this video clip from CNN in the event that you haven't already seen it. Um, so I know that video, let's get the video up and we'll go to that. Here's what's great. I am going to, we're just having a little bit of tech difficulty today, but it's all going to work out, I promise. Just stick with me because um, we are not going to let this journey take us out. All right, here we go with our video. There's a huge economic burden that comes along with this condition of osteoarthritis. It's both indirect and direct costs. You can see employees who are taking more sick days. You can see people who are at work who may not be as productive at work. Some people may not be able to work. That's a huge strain on the system. I do believe in COVID. Yes, yes. At Playmakers Barbershop in Atlanta, the tight fades are blended with energetic and sometimes loud discussions about who's the greatest basketball player of all time. My name was Giannis before the basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> but now COVID-19 stimulus checks and the COVID vaccines are talked about just as passionately. Uh, I really don't trust it because it um, actually came kind of fast. Barbara Giannis Willis feels strongly that the development of COVID-19 vaccines was rushed and comes with serious side effects. People that take it, they um, they had Bell palsy. Outside the shop, James Harris had other concerns. I know the doctor took it and killed him. And the nurse I know live here to kill her. While the CDC and FDA are looking into those and similar claims around the country, Harrison Willis believes underscore a serious concern for Fulton County Health Director Lynn Paxton and her team, who are fighting the misinformation online about as hard as they're battling the virus itself. This vaccine is very effective and very safe. But it's not easy, especially when rumors spread on social media like post claiming baseball legend Hank Aaron died from the vaccine because he received his dose publicly days before passing away. He didn't. The Fulton County Medical Examiner says he died from natural causes. But many in Atlanta's black community believe the claim, forcing health officials to speak out. I think it's just important that we quell these kind of rumors. Which is why Paxton's team is now distributing information in these communities. Seek out trusted sources for information about the vaccine. Facebook and your neighbor next door postings are not trusted sources. Health officials worry misinformation could complicate the process of getting shots in the arms of black and brown communities. New CDC data from the first month of vaccination shows black and Latino people lagging way behind and the state's reporting racial breakdowns. So far, 60% of those vaccinated 
are white compared to 11.5% Latino and just 5.4% black. You're not giving me the option. You're trying to dump it on me. Misinformation isn't the only issue. History is also a major factor for some, including these black healthcare workers who are still on the fence about getting the vaccine. The hesitancy with the African-American community goes back to the um, willing malpractice on African-Americans, i.e. the Tuskegee experiment. The awful decades-long study where black men with syphilis weren't informed or treated, now playing a role in the uphill battle health officials face and trying to convince an already skeptical community to get the COVID vaccine. Let's face it, it was a crime against humanity what happened then. But that happened ages ago. And because of it, it completely changed the landscape for research. Jake, we are in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. This is where they're doing a mass vaccination. And so many people line up every single day, maybe close to a thousand today, but a lot of black people are not showing up. They're talking about going to barbershops. They're talking about getting into the community to talk to more people. I was also told that maybe more sort of sit downs where people could actually have some conversations about their concerns may help. But this is very tough because obviously they need more people to get those shots. Meet the new Samsung Galaxy S21 Plus. I think that's why we're here today because we know we need more conversation. We need more people getting shots. Um, Dr. Purnell, please explain to us what is COVID and why are the vaccines safe? Sure. So when everyone hears the word or the term COVID use, actually that's a abbreviation or an acronym for Coronavirus Disease 2019. SARS-CoV-2 is the actual virus. Um, it was a novel infectious agent um, that probably uh, first emerged back in the winter of 2019. We had our first laboratory confirmed diagnosis in the United States on January 20th. And this unprecedented public health crisis has ripped across the globe. It has ripped across the nation. Um, I like to explain coronavirus, though it is a respiratory um, illness uh, as commonly understood. It's really a host of <laughs> virus. Um, you can see impacts from your neurological systems to impacts to your heart um, and not just, you know, how you breathe, your lungs or pneumonia. What we know about coronavirus is that it's been disproportionately devastating, disproportionately devastating on black and brown communities. Um, while the total death rate in the United States, or the total death toll, I should say, is above 525,000 lives, of which, unfortunately, my father was one, um, although there are more than 29 million Americans who have tested positive disproportionately. We've seen hospital rates anywhere from three to four times higher in black and brown groups. Um, we've seen death rates too, um, in as much as 2.4 2.7 times higher in Native and Indigenous um, populations. So this virus has been destructive. It has changed the social fabric of our lives. The best way to prevent the virus, we know, is through baseline public health measures, physical distancing, um, practicing hand hygiene, and wearing a mask, universal masking. And that's before we were able to arrive at the three vaccines that we have now that have been approved through emergency use authorization. And I want to explain um, a little bit about those vaccines, but specifically around the speed of the development of the vaccines, because I know that has been unsettling for people. Um, I have uh, just a few quick slides that if you could bring those slides up that I could speak to. Okay, uh, let me see. I don't... Well, I can, just, I can just, I can just, so I apologize. I, I don't describe. see the no slides. Problem. In the deck. No problem. So basically how, how did this happen at the pace or the speed that it happened? We're used to vaccine development on average taking seven years or even longer, 10 years. The quickest vaccine to be developed before this was the mumps vaccine. And that was roughly about four years. What enabled this process to be quicker is the nature of the science itself. Both Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA or messenger RNA vaccines. What does that mean? 
these vaccines were able to be designed in a laboratory, right? So it's a genetic re recipe, a genetic a blueprint, a genetic instruction sheet, right? Because we were able to sequence coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2, the actual virus, we know its genetic makeup. Scientists in a lab could design a spike protein that is very similar to the spike protein that is on the coronavirus and responsible for how it's able to attach and invade cells. So we have, as some people have described, a Snapchat message, right? So you take this genetic recipe, um, this genetic recipe was able to be designed in a matter of days. That in and of itself is fundamentally different then when we're talking about other vaccine development, where you have to grow a virus in chicken eggs, or you have to grow the viral proteins in the lab. That made it quicker. What else made it quicker? The process was quicker because there was investment of funding. That funding, um, there they are. Um, you can go back two slides, and you can just, for, for folks to see um, the summary of what made it quicker. The second thing that made it quicker was federal funding. That federal funding allowed this process to range very large scale trials. You see the amount of people who participated in the Johnson & Johnson, the Moderna, and the Pfizer. We're talking about anywhere from 30 to 44,000 persons who participated. I participated in the Moderna um, vaccine trial. Um, after losing my dad, I needed a way to sow forward his legacy. I needed a way as a public health physician to be a part of the solution. That was fundamentally different than the other research that has been done about vaccines. The sheer amount of persons made available by those public-private partnerships that increased um, funding and allowed these drug companies to raise these very large trials allowed us to, to investigate um, these vaccines in a broader array of people. The diversity that you see represented here is diversity that had not been achieved in um, clinical research or specifically vaccine trials previously allowed us to say it's generalizable. And the last thing that I'll say about what made this process different is that typically when we're learning about vaccines, there there is a, a, a sequential process. First, the vaccine is tested to see if it's safe and effective. Once that has been demonstrated and proven, then the drug company works on manufacturing, works on the logistics of the manufacturing. And those processes, when they're done sequentially, makes the entire development process longer. During this pandemic, because it was a public health emergency, federal funding made it possible to do those tracks in parallel. The fact that those tracks were done in parallel without corners being cut, without there being unethical guidelines without the science being sacrificed allowed us to get an effective, safe tool to market quicker. That's what made this process different. And the last thing I'll say is that the science didn't just hatch overnight. I want the public to understand that. The science has actually been building, building, building across the past decade, okay? Both for the J&J, &J, which used an adenovirus viral vector. That's how it's different from the messenger RNA vaccines and from Moderna and Pfizer, okay? So this was a leg up because of the previous discoveries and research that had been done. And then those other reasons that I explained gave us three tools with excellent efficacy or effectiveness and an excellent safety profile. Awesome, thank you so much. I wanna bring uh, Dr. Jackson into this conversation as well, um, because you've given us the the science of the vaccine and the science of COVID-19. But this disease also has a mental impact on our community. And that's the other, that's another part of the science as well. So Dr. Jackson, we know in recent months, the concerns of COVID has just had a tremendous impact on our mental wellness as well. Please share with us what are some of the things that we're seeing, anxiety, stress, depression, suicide, substance abuse. How bad is it and how can we repair the damage? Thank you for that introduction. And first and foremost, I appreciate this invitation. I hats off to the president and to Bowie State and also for um, Mr. Thompson for bringing together. And I also want to give a shout out to Dr. Purnell for a fabulous job he just did as you were waiting for your slides to come to play. I 
bring this slide here because I wanna put my response in context. It's important to know that members of the Association of Black Psychologists like myself, we are trained in, in a part of the American Psychological Association through our training. And some of us are still involved as a licensed clinical psychologist as I am. However, we are extremely distinct as an as a organization from APA. The Association of Black Psychologists was actually born for this exact reason. In 1968, we clearly understood the complexities of mental health when it relates to that of Black people in the context of what we now call healthcare disparities. In the 60s, we were, the APA was still operating under the assumption of one size fits all. Everyone's psychology and well being in mental health was coming from the same blueprint, which most times looked like predominantly white, middle class, heterosexual folks and was not paying attention to the cultural nuances that each group brings to bear, nor were they strategically paying attention to the idea of systemic structural racism that was actually causing more psychological harm and mental health well-being, um, challenging our well-being as well. So within the Association of Black Psychologists, this is actually our mission statement, but more specifically in the last 50 plus years, we have been unearthing and speaking about what does it mean to be healthy and whole from a black centered perspective. So when we think about our, the wisdom in our communities, when our mamas used to tell us that when one group catches a cold, we catch pneumonia. That is the wisdom that we are now saying in a scientific way that we have clear evidence that shows healthcare disparities, that it's not about it's not about my blackness that leaves me more vulnerable to depression, anxiety. It's about the situation that I'm in, those ways in which um, providers either intentionally or unintentionally do not see my illness or my um, psychological stress in the same way they might they, their own other counterparts. So I wanna give that context here very clearly because when we look at the increase of depression, anxiety, um, even the suicidal ideation, we have to be very clear. These are normal reactions to abnormal situations. And all of us are experiencing this, experience this right now, both providers and those who we are caring for. So how do we move forward? We, we move forward by first and foremost, recognizing that this trauma is real and we are all experiencing it. No one is immune from it. We can no longer go with that individualist perspective of, you know, the strong, the strong survive and I have to keep pushing through and can't share that I'm hurting, worried, scared and free. No, we have to stop and really honor that and say that that's what's going on. Also, when we pay attention to what's happening within our own mind, body and spirit, how do we recognize that when our heart is beating fast or we're thinking too fast and we're losing our capacity to make good informed decisions, we start feeling bad about how we just sort of popped off at someone and it's not what we meant. Well, that's a time to sort of center, take a breath, sit still. And it's also a way for, for us as people of color, black and brown, many of us find our centeredness in community with one another. I, I believe that all of the things that we've promoted in terms of meditation and yoga and other individual approaches like that are valuable. What I'm saying is we must also add to that family care, community care, and and dealing with these stressors together. And that may mean listening intently to one another, not trying to fix or solve or judge or talk somebody out of their feelings, but how do we genuinely affective and clearly listen to what they have to say, valid where they are, validate where they are, and then leave room for them to move forward. And I just wanna underscore that this came out in the video clip that we saw, these conversations are happening in the places where health and healing operates, which is more than in the professional room. It operates in our communities, it's in our hair salons, in our barbershops, in our places of worship, in our Greek letter organizations on our campuses. So we have to shift our way to thinking about it that way. I'm gonna be okay because you're gonna be okay and we're gonna be okay. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, for setting the stage. And, it, and it's amazing how some of those everyday things that are just good for general wellness are really good in COVID as well. And what I especially appreciate is your comment about the need for community wellness. And I have to say, I've brought Dr. Hill into this conversation because if it's one aspect of the community that we need to be focused on, it is our nurses. So Dr. Hill, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really need to know, how are the nurses doing? What are they thinking about this? Are they excited that we now have a vaccine? Some of them are. And some of them, as you saw in the video, are a little hesitant about getting the vaccine. And of yep. course, that's, that's based on history. So uh, like anything, you have to, someone needs to see someone like you, or for, for example, me, who I've taken the vaccine. I took the Pfizer vaccine. No okay. side effects at all. And I've encouraged others to take it as well. But as far as nurses who are on the front lines, of course, they're all, all stressed out. They have to do multiple things now. Death is all around them more frequently now, even though they've had, you know, depending on what area they've worked in, they've dealt with death, but now it's every day, all day long. And so some have described it as uh, PTSD, stepping away from the profession because they're just so overwhelmed with it. And not to mention that dealing with their own family members and friends who are dying of COVID, so there are a lot of things to consider. So for me, with my nursing students, since I'm the chair of the undergraduate nursing program of, of the Department of Nursing at Bowie State, my students are afraid. But what we have done and the university has supported us is for to provide a safe environment for them. Yes. And so and let's, let's take a look at that video so we can see that program in action. Okay. And then we'll come back to you. Just one. My name is Deborah Coppage, and I am going to give you a tour of our state-of-the-art nursing education facilities. At the heart of the Bowie State campus is the Center for Natural Sciences, Mathematics, and Nursing, one of the region's premier centers for transformational, hands-on learning and research. In the nursing department, students get practical experience in a nursing simulation wing, equipped with the latest technology in nursing education. This virtual tool will give you an inside view of the experiential instruction that is the foundation of how Bowie State is preparing our nursing graduates to take on the global healthcare challenges of today and tomorrow. Join me as we begin our tour. That was fantastic. You obviously have a world-class program at Bowie State in nursing. What have you observed about working nurses pursuing their master's degrees and their stress and anxiety levels? I know many of them are probably working moms and wives as well. Yes, they are. And what the graduate students have verbalized is that they, they miss the face-to-face -face interaction in the classroom setting since everything went virtual last year because of COVID. And so that was an outlet for them to actually leave work and come to the school. But now with managing work and teaching the kids at home, which is a new task, a new job that they have, it's kind of overwhelming for them. So they're looking forward to the day when they can return back to the campus, the face-to-face -face, uh, instruction that they were accustomed to. Absolutely. Well, you know, we have other folks that we want to bring into this conversation. So I'm popping them right onto the screen now. And Dr. Jackson, welcome back. Um, we are now um, joined uh, by Dr. Nadozi as well as Dr. Jordan Alston. And we are discussing um, just mental health and coping mechanisms. So I want to get you all in on this conversation. What are some of the coping uh, mechanisms that you would recommend? So if I could kind of give you a picture of what a wellness model looks like from a Absolutely. counseling perspective. So in a wellness model from a counseling perspective, you have five essential elements. And we can break these elements down into further dimensions. But just to give you an umbrella approach, you have physical, you have mental, you have emotional, you have social, and you have spiritual. With COVID-19, if you look at LA Fitness, if you look at Planet Fitness, if you look at most of the gyms, there's reconstruction. Everything's shut down. 
So people that were getting their needs met through these group rooms, group situations, boot camps, things of that nature, and going to a gym, all of a sudden it shut down. I was on a panel about two weeks ago with someone, an NBA coach and um, someone from the CIAA, and they were talking about the impact that it was even having on their players. But it's not just athletes that are impacted and need physical connections. It's people in general. So it's been affected with COVID. When you go to mental and emotional, um, we, we can talk about the level of trauma. Most people in America um, have experienced trauma because of COVID, grief and loss at a higher rate than we've ever seen. But for African-Americans in general, we're not just talking about COVID because you also can recognize that we're in a, what the American Psychological Association president calls a racism pandemic. Um, so in the midst of COVID, you had Breonna Taylor's. In the midst of COVID, you had Freddie Jackson, Fred Gray, I'm sorry. In the midst of COVID, you have all of the, the White House just a couple of weeks ago. You have all of these things going on. So how do you get your needs met or mental and emotional if you're not even recognizing them? So one coping mechanism is to stop and reflect daily, to get a journal out and to actually write out what you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you start to notice patterns that you're experiencing stress at levels that are not healthy for you, then you reach out for help. Now, you may not be in a traditional counseling situation, but counseling looks different now. You can do virtual counseling, telehealth services. There are a number of community services. And most of us who have health insurance, you can have you have services that are covered under your health care. Last two pieces, then I'll move on. Social, where we were doing social gatherings and things of that nature, you're not able to go to the, your social gatherings like you used to. Everything because of COVID shifted. So you have to still get those social needs met. And how do you do that? Um, you have to be creative in that. We have to maximize technology. It's not the best, but it's what we make. We, we can make the best use of it to still have those social interactions, support groups, things of that nature. And last but not least, another coping mechanism that I would strongly suggest is in addition to those social supports and those other mechanisms. When we talk about religion, because that's a part of spirituality is a part of um, coping mechanisms for everyone. But when you talk about the African-American population, over 80% identify either with the Islamic culture or being a Christian. Well, if mosques and churches are shut down because of COVID, you still have to figure out how you get your spiritual needs met. Um, and so you have to explore that with your faith leaders and connect to people in the community virtually where you probably weren't having to do that at first. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Okay. Thank you so much. And we've brought David Thompson. Are you back with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Welcome Wonderful. Well, I will leave the rest of the questions to you. Thank you for letting me sit in your seat for a moment. Oh, please. Thank you very much. And I apologize to, to, to the fine guests that we have here tonight. Um, technology is technology. I, I should say my technology is technology. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to maybe sort of... Um, double back a little bit and, 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 and delve into a little more deeper in terms of um, where we are right now in the pandemic and, and the lives that are still at stake. And um, I'd, I'd like to, for us to talk a little bit about why is it that the numbers I'm reading say that, you know, um, upwards of 35 to 37% of African-Americans have said they're not going to take this COVID test. So what that means, what that tells me, there are going to be households where you'll have individuals who had the test and individuals who have not had the test. And I wonder what, what is that going to do in terms of um, increasing exposure and in and, and, and cases? Dr. Purnell. Sure. So if you drill down on what the polls are actually showing us, um, David, I think there's something encouraging there. We've seen, seen a trend from December to January to now across the nation with more people even already having gotten one shot or are encouraged to receive their shot as soon as possible. What do you see larger in the Black and African American community and even in the Latinx community is this wait and see category where back, Black people have more informational needs that have not been met, right? And those informational needs are either shaped by um, historical injustices or the awareness and experience of ongoing and present day racism or just barriers around access. So what we need to be able to do in public health is in plain spoken terms, meet people where they are, 
talk about the science in ways that it's understandable, um, that it's digestible, and then give them the information that helps move them forward. Black people flip out of that wait and see category when they have someone within their community or someone within their family circle who has been vaccinated. So we have to continue to amplify and elevate the stories of other black and brown persons who've been vaccinated and can talk about their experience. Um, black people across multiple polls, and all, we're not monolithic, but this is just what the polling data is showing us, have questions about, um, will this vaccine cause me to miss time from work? Um, is this vaccine safe? What are the side effects that I can expect with this vaccine? When we're able to explain that side effects are routine, that side effects means that the immune system is working because the body is going through its inflammatory process, not because you've been infected from coronavirus. And people can say that who look like the communities that they're talking to, we begin to see that change. So we in public health, the federal government, states, cities, none of us can afford to let up. None of us can afford to be silent. We must continue to talk about the science and we must continue to help people understand it. And finally, we have to make sure that we're removing convenience barriers, whether it's location and time or transportation. We have to make sure we're removing language or literacy barriers because when that happens, we see movement and we have seen it from December to today. So David, if I can also add to that as well, because I really appreciate those comments. So the Association of Black Psychologists is one of a group with the alliances of ethnic psychological associations who is partnered with the Congressional Black Caucus and the National Urban League, where we are charged with doing a mixed method study of trying to understand the COVID vaccine, excuse me, the COVID in communities of color. So we have other ethnic psychological associations here with us. As a matter of fact, we just released a um, op-ed in the Washington Post just yesterday authored by uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass and others just to that point saying that the hesitancy around the vaccine has probably more to do with access than anything else. And what I also wanna add to kind of help us in this conversation is to shift it in terms of our approach. This idea of the hesitancy is not a problem. It's a protective factor. We have to, as healthcare providers, we have to move the conversation from the, from the limitations about the Tuskegee study. That was not the only, we have a longstanding history, as this slide shows, of healthcare providers doing wrong in communities of color. Communities, period, but our focus tonight is within the black community. And so even as recent as when um, Dr. Susan Moore died, she was very clear for her that this felt like she was being treated differently because of her black skin. We look at the John Hopkins lead study that happened in the 1990s, which is a replication of the Tuskegee, where the John Hopkins was wanting to understand the impact of high lead for the developing child. So we strategically place black and brown children in homes with high lead weight. And, and of course, there's a number of neurological damages and all kinds of things that happen to that community. So I'm just saying to say, shift away from trying to blame our communities for being hesitant and instead be, how do we earn the trust by validating that they do have a reason to be suspect. That's not from the past, this is the here and now today. And then at the same time, say, how can I earn your trust? I think I want to, when I listened to the clip that was on early, I took down this quote. I, I, con I concurred with much of what was being said, but I did take issue with the comment of um, it's a crime against humanity that's no longer happening. That is where the problem lies. This is still happening intentionally and unintentionally because that's what we mean by systemic racism and structural racism that we're still sitting in now. So I, I think if we're going to move forward and support our communities in deciding to take the vaccine or not, it has to be more like this, real talk, real language that they can understand, make decisions for themselves and not be talked at or talked into or dismissed for their um, hesitancy, if you will, but they should be embraced for that. And I'll close by saying, we're not the only ones hesitant, but I do think it's interesting that this is the predominant story that's being told because many folks are hesitant. 
Dr. Jackson, I want you to hold that thought. I'm going to come back to you, but before that, I want us to basically um, hear from Dr. Hill about what it's like to work with some of the most stressed people in the world, and that's nurses. That's nurses. Some of the most stressed people in the world right now are nurses and doctors. Uh, but before she starts talking, we're going to take a real quick look at her department. My name is Deborah Coppage, and I am going to give you a tour of our state-of-the-art nursing education facilities. At the heart of the Bowie State campus is the Center for Natural Sciences, Mathematics, and Nursing, one of the region's premier centers for transformational, hands-on learning and research. In the nursing department, students get practical experience in a nursing simulation wing, equipped with the latest technology in nursing education. This virtual tool will give you an inside view of the experiential instruction that is the foundation of how Bowie State is preparing our nursing graduates to take on the global healthcare challenges of today and tomorrow. Join me as we begin our tour. Well, Dr. Dr. Hill, you obviously have a have a really strong program going on at Bowie State. Um, but what I want to say is that everything looks good, but you're dealing with nurses in their master's program who are working moms or dads. Um, they are also taking care, as I said, their their own families. What have you noticed over this past year in terms of their stress levels, bringing that to, if you will, to classes? after doing a 12 hour shift at a local hospital? Understandably, it's intense, especially when COVID first came up on the scene in March and students were concerned about not being able to actually go to clinical settings and fulfilling their clinical hours, but we worked out uh, a way for, them, for that to occur. And so that gave them some relief. So you can imagine that you're already in a stressful profession and then you're trying to work on your, your master's degree and combined with taking care of a family, that's a lot of pressure on you. So one of the things that we did was we tried to work with the students and of course, listen to them, gave them referrals for, we had a counselor to come in from the university to come in and talk to the students, but you know, they're, they're up to here already and some things they already know. So some things they're receptive to and other things they're not, but we continue to work with them and encourage them and try to understand how it is to be on the home front, on the, I mean, on the front lines of a pandemic. So I, I stated earlier that some uh, faculty or some students were talking about their experience in post-traumatic syndrome because of a stress, because of what they're enduring, death all around them on a regular basis, and then coming home and not and being scared that they might give something to their family. So that's a lot of isolation as it relates to that. And, and some nurses have talked about not at least leaving the profession. Let's personalize this a little bit. Have you had yourself had had to put your arms around some of your people and counsel them yourself? Uh, so with, uh, with social distance, yes. <laughs> okay. Right. okay. I'm not comfortable putting my arms around anyone right now, but uh, the compassion comes out in my, my, my voice and looking at them and just talking to them and understanding what they may be going through at the bedside. So I use that compassionate part and, you know, give them direction and guidance, tell them, take time out for themselves because you got to take care of self before you can take care of anyone else. So those are the kind of, uh, that's the kind of talk I give to the students. Of course, they're concerned about safety, even when they come on campus, but the campus is uh, doing really well as far as maintaining a safe environment. Uh, we have another uh, video that's not shown tonight well, we, what we've done since COVID has occurred and where we have the signage for six feet between individuals, we have the, the thermal thermometers, we have the, the uh, plexiglass dividers, a lot of a safe environment, only six students in a room at a time. We have COVID testing on a regular basis. So some of the, those are some of the things, the measures we have implemented to make sure that everyone is safe. Okay. Now, one, one thing I think I'm one, I know that I'm wondering about, I'm quite sure many of the viewers are wondering about too. Have you had to alter how you teach your, your curriculum or whatever to, to, to COVID because of all the stress from the nurses, 
the fact that everything's virtual. How have you had to adapt to that? Absolutely. That was a, a quick pivot <laughs> because we are a face to face. We have a face to face environment. And a, a lot of students, that's what they love about being at uh, Bowie State at an HBCU is that you have that nurturing environment where, you, where faculty can actually put their arms around you and encourage you and laugh and talk with you and, you know, uh, do things like that. So when we had to do go to uh, switch to online teaching, then that was a stressor, not just for the students, but for the faculty as well. But measures were put in place where we students had to learn. It was a quick study. We had to learn how to do virtual uh, simulated experiences. Some of the companies worked with us to provide resources where they had virtual uh, uh, technology to utilize to help the students using avatars, things like that. And so in, in, in the classroom, it went from all online teaching. And what we find is that students aren't familiar with online. They like being face to face. So now they've gotten comfortable with the online modality. So now we, they don't turn the cameras on. <laughs> <laughs> or what, whatever reason. So if you tell them to turn the camera on, they, you know, they might still be in the bed or they may be at work. <laughs> it's like that. So you have to remind them you're still in class. So you need to dress accordingly. So, you know, so it's an adjustment for, for everyone. OK, OK. I, I just wanted to, wanted to clarify that and make sure that you see how things were had changed. And I'm quite sure, as they say, everything has changed now. Now, I was I was wanted to talk about um, monoclonal antibodies with um, Dr. Stanley, but I don't think she's with us uh, this evening. Or there she is, she is with us. I'm sorry, Dr. Stanley. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Stanley. So, so having said that, um, monoclonal antibodies is is basically a treatment uh, that a lot of people haven't heard about, a lot of people don't know about, and. Um, I think now, and um, I'm quite sure Dr. Stanley or Dr. Purnell will correct me, but I think right now we have to have everything on the table to look at it if it's been FDA approved. One, because of the variants that are coming in. They seem to have to be, as they say, supercharged. So having said that, I wanna um, 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 turn this over to Dr. Stanley to let her um, talk, talk to us about these monoclonal antibodies. Uh, thanks for having me. And you know, as much as we want people to get vaccinated, and that's the ultimate, um, we have to realize that people are still going to get infected. And the last time I listened in the last couple of days, there are still 60,000 new cases of um, COVID. So people are still getting infected. And what I find is, much like many modalities, we as people of color are the last ones to know about it. So I wanted to make the audience aware of the only real treatment for outpatient mild to moderate COVID-19. Um, and it's called monoclonal antibody therapy. And what monoclonal antibodies are, they are neutralizing antibodies. They are the antibodies that our bodies will ultimately make when we get the vaccine and our immune system has time to make those antibodies. But when you get them as a treatment, a monoclonal antibody treatment, you're actually getting the antibodies. And they're designed to neutralize the virus. That's what we want. They are after that spike protein, just like the vaccines are after that spike protein. Because we know that when the spike protein is tampered with, neutralized, then the virus cannot attach to our cells and replicate. Um, so these monoclonal antibody treatments are authorized for mild to moderate COVID-19 in adults and children over 12. Um, this is, you cannot even receive it in the hospital. This is outpatient treatment, which makes it really exciting. And it's not either or, oh, I'll just get infected and get the monoclonal antibody. No, this is something that is available right now in the event that if you are waiting, you're trying to make your final decision and you get infected, you don't have to just go home and, and if you fit the requirements, you don't have to go home, get sick and potentially end up in the hospital. Um, there are a couple of uh, monoclonal therapies, uh, really cocktails, because both of them now are two 
drugs. So Eli Lilly has their brand of it, Bamlanivimab and Edisepimab, and Regeneron also has um, a cocktail. And people say, well, I've never even heard of that. Well, let me just say this, you really have, if you paid any attention to when our previous president got infected and he went into the hospital and it seems like he got out of the hospital and was just like over it. But we know that he received monoclonal antibody therapy and it, it likely, even though he was an inpatient, it likely affected his recovery positively. We thought it was too expensive though. But what we didn't know that studies were underway and in November of 2020, these different monoclonal antibody therapies received um, emergency use authorization. Next slide. And this is just a, a, an investigation. Um, it was out of JAMA, January 21st, so it's very recent. And this was a particular um, study for, at least initially, they were giving just the bamlanivimab as monotherapy, but this study actually used it in combination with another monoclonal antibody. And what they saw is that among non-hospitalized patients with mild to moderate COVID-19, treatment with both of these therapies as a, um, compared to placebo was associated with a statistically significant reduction in SARS-CoV-2 viral load at day 11. The thing about this monoclonal therapy, it is very effective, but you can't drag your feet. You can't wait seven to 10 days and say, oh, I just think I have the flu or some other kind of virus. This treatment is most effective within the first seven days of, of um symptoms, but certainly 10 days at the longest. Next slide. So this is just a visual. Um, number one is, and, and actually Regeneron is doing a, a study where they inject the monoclonal therapy, but for the most part, they are infusions. So if you started having symptoms, you immediately went and got tested, you were positive, and you fit certain requirements, which I'll show you in just a minute, you should immediately call your primary care doctor or, or a doctor that's in your, taking care of you in some manner and request this monoclonal therapy, antibody therapy. So once you receive an infusion, it takes about an hour to get the infusion, and then you have to wait. The total from time you get there to time you're gone is about three hours. Um, and this is done in hospitals, uh, some ERs, some infusion centers. And when they inject you with the antibodies, the antibodies latch on to the virus to those red spike proteins that want to attach to our cells. So they neutralize, they neutralize those um, spike proteins. Without that, we know those spike proteins find their way into our cells and they replicate like crazy in our nasal passages and our respiratory tract. So after you receive these antibodies and they bind up and neutralize the spike proteins, then the virus cannot stick to our cells and therefore it cannot replicate and make us sick and die. Next slide. So these are the eligible pe people. And unfortunately, what you're going to see in these eligible patients are very common, particularly in people of color, obesity or BMI over 35 chronic kidney disease, diabetes, immunosuppressive disease, um, age over 65. So most of the, the centers that do this, they're not looking for, oh, you have to have four of these or five of these. Age over 65 and obesity or being overweight, or BMI over 31 qualifies you. Then you can even be younger than 65. You can be uh, 55 or older and have cardiovascular disease, High blood pressure, how common is that, unfortunately? But it qualifies people to get this monoclonal antibody therapy. Um, also, if you have COPD and respiratory disease, that link that you see, combatcovid.hhs.gov, you can sign, you can you know sign on there and it will locate the hospitals and centers in all across this country. Listen, the federal government sent out 660,000 doses of this monoclonal antibody therapy. And a lot of it's sitting on the shelf. 
And people say, well, why isn't this, why aren't we hearing more about this? Why aren't we? Well, I could probably answer that in a lot of ways. You know, it does take time. You have to have a certain level of facility and staffing and all manner of other answers that I don't even want to get into here, but it is available. I don't care where you live, even in small rural areas. So if you know somebody, if you get infected, if you meet the qualifications or you know somebody, be an advocate for them to get this monoclonal um, therapy. The, there's no payment. You don't pay for the actual therapy. Of course, there is some expense related to you know, the staffing and, and the, you know, the IV, all the things that go along with receiving treatment, but you certainly are not going to pay for the monoclonal antibody therapy. So it is available. You know, I like to think that we are empowered um, with as much information as possible. So we don't have to just go home and, you know, people go to the emergency room all the time with COVID and they just tell them, well, we can't really do much for you. So they send you home. But there really is possibly, if you qualify, there is a treatment that is a, it's, it's effective. And if you go out on the internet now, you'll see all manner of people getting it, but there are still parts of this country where it is not talked about much. Well, well Dr. Stanley, I mean, that's, that's I, I for lack of a better term, that's, that's, that's more than impressive. I think more people need to know about that. Now, if they still have some reservations, would you advise them to talk to their, to their primary care physician about it to get a little better feel for it? Oh, absolutely. And the challenge is, is a lot of primary care doctors don't know about it, but I've been able to help people help their primary. So people, I get calls and texts and messengers every morning during this pandemic from people who've either been diagnosed, they just don't know what to do. So it's an opportunity. So one lady in Louisiana contacted me. I said, okay, here's a treatment that I believe you qualify for. So not only did she get the information about the um, monoclonal therapy, her doctor got it. And thank God this doctor, woman of color in the urban core, she, she didn't say, well, I don't know about that stuff. She took the time to learn about it. And my friend ended up getting infusion and it really turned her course. So, so right now there are two, basically there's, there, there are two, um, monoclonal an antibodies available, correct, right now? There have been a, a, a Are two cocktails. So each one of them uh, consists okay. of two different um, two, two cocktails. Now, I, I read the other day that there are, there is at least one or maybe two other cocktails that are in clinical trials. And I want to expand upon that some because when we talk about clinical trials for monoclonal um, antibodies or other, um, if you would, um, uh, medications, um, there's, there's been difficulty in the past to get enough um, black people to participate. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we, uh, darling to happen, particularly as these, these new medications are being developed um, so soon. So I'd, I'd like um, everybody to weigh in on this um, because I think there's a, there's some, there's a lot of think of psychological people are going, I don't know if I'm gonna do that at all. Um, because when they do these clinical trials, there's clinical trials for adults and children. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, uh, the clinical trials um, and Dr. Nandozi, lead us off with that, please. Yes. Good evening, everybody. And uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson, for hosting this uh, this fantastic event. Thank you all um, for your insight today. Um, so you know, we're talking about clinical trials and uh, getting people enrolled and getting people, I guess, uh, less uh, sensitive or apprehensive toward uh, being a part of clinical trials. And I do want to highlight the importance of our involvement as Black people in clinical trials because there is a lack of mm -hmm. literature on um, on medical treatments and medical diseases in African Americans. Um, sometimes we find in the textbooks that these things are highlighted in such a way that if you were to see it in an African American or in a Black individual in general, you wouldn't be able to identify it because uh, it doesn't look like what you're used to seeing in the textbooks. Um, and uh, for this reason, it is really important for us to participate in the clinical trials as well for treatment because we need to know how it, how mm -hmm. things turn out to work in an African-American population as well, just as much as we need to know in any other population. Um, and uh, for genetic reasons, they can be, they can, they can vary quite greatly. So uh, that's what I got for that. Okay. And, 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 and Dr. Purnell, you participated in clinical trials yourself. 
Yes. Correct? Could you elaborate, please? Could you elaborate? So, um, you know, I started off earlier this evening talking about the loss of my father. Um, I tell people that the coronavirus pandemic didn't just land in New York and New Jersey when we were the epicenter last spring, but it landed on me personally. Um, and I needed a way as a daughter who had lost a father, had a sister who's a COVID-19 long hauler, and seeing my black and brown community in Newark and more broadly devastated to be a part of the solution. And I knew exactly what a good doctor was just describing, that part of the inequity is that black and brown persons aren't represented in clinical research. And it's a host of reasons why we aren't represented in research at the numbers that are um, commiserate with our proportion of the population. A lot of that has to do again with access, access to opportunity, um, convenience, meaning the time, the location is an mm -hmm. economic cost. So I knew that I had the ability to participate. And this was my way of, um, practicing my accountability in community. So I enrolled in the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine trial. Um, I had my first injection in August, the end of August. I had my second injection in early October. At the time, I didn't know if I had been vaccinated with the actual vaccine or if I had only received placebo. It's something called double blinded, right? I didn't know. And the researcher running the trial didn't know. Um, the first injection, I can tell you, I got pain in my arm. Um, it wasn't unusual for me. It felt like my experience when I got my flu shot. Um, I also got headaches um, and they lasted for a couple of days, but then they went away. Um, and my temperature was never a fever, uh, but it did increase. It was just a low grade. Other than that, I didn't really have many symptoms. Um, I was closely followed. Um, I would receive text messages where I had to put uh, possible symptoms in an app. I received phone calls. Um, I went into the clinic site to be physically examined, have lots of blood drawn and to be tracked. Then I got my second dose. And my second dose, my experience was different. Um, by the end of the day, I had severe tiredness. Um, and it was out of a proportion for my normal tiredness at the end of the day. <laughs> um, and so in addition, I had a, a higher elevation in my temperature, still not a fever, but higher. 100. Um, and again, I had that headache. Those symptoms quickly dissipated. The tiredness, the slight bump in my temperature, gone in 24 hours. And the headaches will always would linger longer. So what I want people to know, and I said this earlier, and I'm going to emphasize it again, side effects from vaccines, especially when we in, in the medical community say vaccines are reactogenic, meaning that the immune system gets activated, the inflammatory process is activated, and that's what you're experiencing. So side effects are routine, side effects are normal, side effects are to be expected, because then you will get them, but it's possible or even right. less likely that you will get them. Okay, okay thank you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna keep moving along because there's a lot a lot more ground we need to cover. And I, I wanna now um, come to um, Dr. Jordan. Um, going back in the mental mental health space. Now we're gonna bounce back and forth a, a little bit here. But Dr. Jordan, um, hasn't COVID-19 sort of taken taken us to a whole different place when it comes to younger people um, dealing with substance use disorder? Isn't isn't that just grown exponentially just in the last year? Yes, but it certainly has. So somewhere around June, so you think about last year, June, three months into the pandemic, we saw a spike in mental health symptoms, um, multi mental illness and symptoms related to mental illness for more than 40% of America's total population. If I backtrack a little bit, prior to us coming into that phase of higher reported mental illness symptoms, you were, we were already in an opioid epidemic. Um, and beyond the opioid epidemic, alcoholism just runs rapid. It still it still has because of COVID and because of the increase in mental illness symptoms. Um, there has been a spike in SUD. So substance use disorders has spiked to an all time high. Um, and because of that, there there's been a lot of focus in 
the recovery movement. Um, but I, I would like to say, in addition to the resources that are available for people that are in recovery, like peer recovery specialists and mental uh, clinicians, community health care workers, things of that nature that kind of touch both ends, I think there has to be more of a focus on prevention. If we can talk about the mental illness and the mental substance, sometimes we don't have to reach SUD. But SUD, to, to answer your question, has spiked at an all-time high. Um, and not in any positive way uh, that one of the, you know, when we look at economic shifts, there have been alcohol sales in the United States has risen at an all time high. So not just the opioid epidemic, um, but just alcoholism in general over the, when every other industry was failing or collapsing. Um, many industries were failing and collapsing. Alco alcohol sales were going off the top of the roof. And, and why is because people are looking towards that as a coping mechanism to not have to deal with reality. No one stops as a child and says, when I get older, I want to have a substance use disorder It's the way that people find to cope. It's maladaptive, but people are coping. Um, we just got to give them new ways to, to strategize to cope up front. Okay, um, what, what you what, what you're painting is to me is is a is, is a bleak picture, but we got to be positive. Why I say it's a bleak picture is because even before COVID came on the scene, our mental health issues in the community were bad. Now they've doubled or tripled. What can we do? What can we do as a nation to make sure when we come out of post pandemic, we aren't at the same place now or even further behind where it was when COVID started. I, I honestly believe in the peer recovery movement. And so people don't, um, not, a lot of people don't know what peer recovery specialists do, but peer recovery specialists are individuals who have lived experiences with SUD. So either they had a family member or they themselves have uh, experienced SUD, a substance use disorder in their history. With that being said, when we talk about trust factors in the community, Peer recovery specialists are people that walk like you, talk like you, have lived similar experiences to you, and they can help connect you to resources. Um, sometimes peer recovery specialists are called community health care workers, and the title is interchangeable. But those are our connectors. If we can get more peer recovery specialists deployed and, and trained um, in our communities, then what we have are people that can actually connect you to mental health uh, services and to physical health services for that matter. But I think we're looking for a key because a lot of times we set up outpatient practices and we expect people to come to us, but we have to figure out a way that's actually meeting people where they are. And peer recovery specialists is just one of those avenues that is shown to be an evidence-based practice, even inside of minority communities. Dr. Stanley, we know the back, we're trying to get as many people as we can to get the vaccine, um, sort of educate them that this is something that, that they need to do, have to do. But I, I'm noticing now that there seems to be a rush because of these B, the B117 variant coming from the UK. Um, could you and, and, and Dr. Purnell sort of uh, delve into that and, and, and tell us why that's of such major concern to, to physicians and scientists? Well, I'll just say, and Dr. Burnell can probably go into more detail. You know, we are going along a course where we're trying to get people vaccinated against something that we we knew. So now you get new things introduced, variants, and there's another level of question mark. Is this same vaccine we're going to cover these variants? You know, my attitude and from what I can hear from high level scientists is we have to continue to move forward. Um, not with blinders on, but we have to continue with the effort to get as many people vaccinated with our current vaccines, continue to monitor these variants. I mean, the, I know the B117 has just increased phenomenally in certain parts of this um, this country. And, and there's this nagging concern that we're going to see another, maybe not a surge like we saw uh, December or January, but certainly see an increase in number of cases as more and more, because B117, as I understand, is more transmissible. So it's easier to get people infected. And as long as a virus, here's the, here's the, here's the, the real need for people to get vaccinated because as long as there are people who are not vaccinated, there are people who are gonna get infected, the virus is gonna multiply, and it's a multiplying virus that can get can become a variant. 
So a, a virus cannot be a variant unless it's multiplied. Mm -hmm. So we have to reduce the number of people getting infected so that we can try to get some. But right now, it's, to me, it's full speed ahead with what we have, with what we know, and learn along the way. Yes. Um, I won't add much to that because Dr. Stanley said it all, right? So it's like if you're running a race, you need to focus on the finish line and not turn around to see what's on your back. You do need people in the back screaming, run, run, run. <laughs> you don't need to turn around. So basically, we in public health, we need to do more genomic sequencing. We need to have more robust surveillance so that we can identify the variants as they emerge. Fact, variants have been with us. We just haven't been looking for them. Mm -hmm. Now we are better at looking for them. Knowing that variants are with us, like the B117 or the UK variant as it is described, approximately about responsible about 20% of new cases in the United States. But there is some variability across states, like for instance, in the more populous states like Florida, it's potentially responsible for about 30% of new cases. That's why there is a need to get ahead of it. What we know about the three vaccines that have been approved through emergency use authorization, all are effective against the B117 variant. The concern about variants more generally, however, and so that's when you start to talk about the South Africa var variant, um, is that some of them may evade immunity somewhat, right? So meaning that the vaccine works, but maybe not as effective as it did against what we call the wild type, what was occurring at baseline. So that's why it's important to get as many people vaccinated as possible and to still practice those public health measures. Physical distancing, safe hand hygiene, meaning washing your hands, um, universal masking in public, and avoiding crowded, cramped indoor spaces. Thank you. Thank you, both Dr. Stanley and, and, and Purnell. Um, now I want to sort of shift to talk a little bit about health policy. Don't, you, don't all of you agree that if there's ever been a time for a new health policy, the time is now. Um, and I say that because um, black communities are fraught with um, you know, healthcare disparities. Social determinants of health basically almost dictate in some, some communities you know, how long you live, how long you die. How does health policy have to be changed so we can, so we can have better control of our lives? So I'd like to start with that one because I also wanna center this around our children. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we also have at this particular time an increase in suicidal ideation and gestures by youth as young as five, four years old, black and brown youth. We have black and brown youth and others who are being caged right now. So I think our health care policies are essential and they should be centered around starting with what's best for children in terms of access to good care and also access to care that is culturally relevant. That will help them to be able to be trusting of the research studies that lead to policies because most times they're in the wings. The number of uh, black and brown people in most of these studies are so small, they do not even warrant significant um, statistical analysis. And so the unique needs of us gets lost in there. And part of the healthcare policy should include coming at this from a community familial like place. Sometimes with good intentions, our policies have been directed on the individual, like the child, if you will. And we're leaving out the systems in which they're sitting in. So, the, so they're still contending with families that are hurting, communities that are hurting. So we so in order to help the children, the policies must be able to include because in, in my work, that's part of the challenge is that the parent may need services, but there's nothing available to them because everything is directed for the child exclusively. So that, that's I, my colleagues. I know will add more. But I really want to bring that into the conversation. If it's it, it has to be child centered so that it can be community familial like centered and impacting the systems in which they're sitting in because they're not at risk children, they're at potential and at risk environments. And if we can do a better job impacting the environments, the children will have a better capacity to contend. Since, since we're, you, you, we're, we're children, um, you're we're talking about children, I have to bring up schools now. Yes, um, perfect example. Our children have lost, 
I think, not a year, two years, because they're already behind in most cases. How do we, how do you make that up? And can it be made up? They're not only just behind, some of them, remember, were already being pushed out. Right. So this code, so this really is a crisis that's happening within our communities, that our school systems also need to be a place of healing so that learning can happen. Our resources should be holding the educators and the youth and the family so that they can feel safe in this space. When we think about, like the, like our dear colleague spoke earlier, Dr. Hill, in terms of the complexities of being a healthcare provider while also having to homeschool your children, if you will, how can we increase the workforce that supports the families in doing the delivery. It has to be beyond just those who are in the, who are the educators now because they're being impacted by this as well too. Maybe it's about you know, bringing back you know, the way in which we used to approach in the hospitals where babies need to be held. There was this beautiful response of sort of bringing in quote grandmothers to hold. Mm -hmm. We're in that same space now. How do we pull upon the community, peer learn whoever, to come in and help in the homeschooling through, through the virtual capacity so that our parents are having some type of respite. And, and, and we have to have people go find them, meet them where they are. School has to show up where the youth are hanging out right now. And that's gonna be through Twitter, all of those different platforms where they live. And then there's also a shortage because many of our youth do not even have access to the technology or they're in settings where the internet is so sparse that they can't have. So again, once again, we have to massage the communities in which they're in so we can help them do better in the classes that we set up for them. I'm gonna stay on school um, because I, 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 I became informed about a statistic a couple years ago that just as they say, blew my mind. And that was that they said right now, I think it was in 2018, the same number of Black doctors um, that are here now are the same number we had in 1970. I said, I can't believe that. What I want to know is what can, what do we have to do to ha basically, if you would, for lack of a better term, beef up our health care force, our doctors in particular, because um, there's going to be a whole lot of post-COVID, as I call, fallout. People who, who are healthy two years ago who are now going to have reoccurring um, instances that need specialists. We need to have more black doctors. How can we get into the schools early to encourage our, our young, young boys and girls, young adults to start taking more science classes, uh, biology, chemistry, physics classes, and, and sort of gear them, push them into medicine? I'll take, I'll take that and start to answer. Um, I think Dr. Jackson framed it appropriately. Um, we have to stop um, pushing the love of learning out of our kids. Kids yes. are geniuses at birth, right? They're intellectually curious. Their brains are plastic. Their brains are growing, developing. They're learning every day. Um, but it, it is the job of public education to cultivate an environment where learning can happen and learning has to happen in a socially and culturally fluent environment as well. Um, we need to remove um, barriers to entry to certain fields, right? So standardized mm -hmm. testing. Standardized testing is a proxy for socioeconomic status. It's not a proxy for for knowledge fund. Um, we need to amplify and raise the profile of practicing physicians, practicing right. nurses, practicing um, therapists, uh, all types of mental health or physical health professionals in the, in the field of health more broadly. Kids need to see that. Um, and as we increase the pipeline, we need to think about funding, funding to programs that are training black doctors. Training black doctors. Um, we need to think about um, just to heart back on your policy. When the pipeline has to be increased. Access has to be increased. That's an offshoot to talk about universal health care. That's an offshoot to talk about community integrated models of care. Um, we have to talk about increase in quality. How do you get an increase in quality? You have to um, 
negate implicit and explicit biases uh, because that impacts health seeking behavior. Why would you trust a vaccine or why would you seek out health care if the system has habitually devalued your existence, right? So that's a part of increasing quality. Um, equity has to be at the center of every health conversation, not just health equity, but racial equity, right? Mm -hmm. To borrow the language of Dean, Dana Matthews says that hospitals have to be hubs of racial healing. Yes, hospitals, hubs of yes. racial healing. That's something that hospitals have to take on their backs. That's a task. That's a mandate. That's an imperative. That's a part of how you redesign policy and system. And then finally, the environments, right? So Dr. Cameron Jones says that racism is... Okay, that's <laughs> like, okay. Racism is a, a system of structuring opportunity whereby one group is advantaged because of the social construct of race based on phenotype, the color of their skin. Another group is disadvantaged because of the social construct of race or phenotype of their skin. But the strength of the society as a whole is sapped by the waste of human resources. So mm -hmm. the system impacts different differences in access, differences in quality, and differences in environments. And we have to shift yeah, Howard. Also, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, I, just, I think I can add a little bit more to that just because um, from I can speak a little bit from firsthand experience. Uh, so born and raised in Baltimore City, I attended Baltimore City public schools. Um, and not to take anything away from my education, but from my experience, um, the, uh, a lot of people who I've encountered uh, did not have the resources that I was privileged to have just because of the support system and the people who I was able to meet almost by chance. Um, you know, I don't choose my parents. I don't choose the friends that I make, but that's what happened to me. And I end up um, coming to this um, level of uh, professional healthcare. Um, but I can see, I can, I've seen firsthand that a lot of people don't have the access to those same resources. Right. Um, and so I think that the pipeline programs is very important. And uh, I think that increase in men mentorship um, a lot of times during my experience, I felt as though um, I had, you know, if I had known this ahead of time in some way, I would have been able to prepare better or do something different or maybe had, you know, uh, had better access to something that could have prepared me. Um, and other times I just felt like sometimes my colleagues just were more prepared than I was because of some of the experience that they had been through or that they maybe came from a family of doctors or something like that. Uh, that wasn't my case. So, um now, what I try to do as much as I can is to reach back and, uh, and you know, people who are in biology programs or, or um, any, any kind of care program, nursing, whatever you have it, um, and just try to, you know, provide like words of encouragement, talk about my experience. Um, and as far back as possible, it starts from it starts from elementary school, just letting kids know that um, they can be what they want to be. Uh, a lot of times in the school, we say that to them, but when they go home, uh, what they see around them is completely different and um, their role models are a different set of people. Uh, and so we have to do our best to continue to reinforce um, the other options that people have and just to, to be there to support people um, in terms of like pipeline programs, mentorship, um, and like you said, like financial resources and just the, the, the image that we have in the hospital and the black community. Um, those are things that we have to put emphasis on in order to um, increase the percentage of African-Americans. And uh, a main reason why this is really important, we have seen laid bare uh, during the pandemic, there was a disproportionate uh, effect on Black people and Black lives um, during the pandemic. A lot of people died, um, and pro this probably could have been prevented or probably could have been less impactful um, if there was more representation from the Black community in the hospitals and healthcare workers. I also think it's an opportunity for us to strategically re-envision education because the structure does not work. First of all, it doesn't work for many folks, but definitely not for black and brown because most it's the first thing to get cut, right? The resources are bare. Many times in our communities of color, the, the, the instructor, the teachers themselves are the least trained, the early career professionals sitting in the most complex trauma settings for education. And so we're setting them both up for a disadvantage. Our educators are the least paid, right? We, we have to, as a country, what are we saying about where our values are and where we are putting our dollars? If we really want to invest in our future, everyone who's involved with the rearing, caring for children need to have 
to be valued economically. Increase, increase not only their resources, their pay. A lot of our good educators are taking personal dollars when we were in person to give to their children. I remember for my own children, we, we, our company would have that capacity where they match every dollar. So what does that mean? In those influent areas, the students are still getting the baseline federal dollars, but because there's so many companies there, they're getting extra dollars from those companies, whereas their inner city counterpart is still doing without because it's not enough. They're still having old textbooks. They, they have refurbished um, laptops. So the, all of these pipelines are real, but we have to re-envision what does it mean to be caring, raising, and educating children? How do we pour our resources back in there? Boost back in having a actual psychologist as part of the care team in supporting and, and expanding that work. That's the team that's, 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 that's being cut first. We're taking out arts. I mean, in order to get to our STEM, the generative creativity is going to be in their musicality, their creativity, their expression of art, their athlete, because that's, that's the whole body, whole learning approach. A child could, could better deal with what they perceive to be the stressors and the hard science if they're building upon their success in the art classroom. And as we pull all that, they're getting more and more failure. So I'll just close it. I think it's time for us to re-envision how we teach that this um, unfortunate situation we're in right now could actually be an opportunity to recalibrate. Looks like everybody's gonna get $1,400 check, those people who qualify, that $1.9 trillion package, done deal. That's nice. What needs to happen to help people in trouble, people of color who are suffering from healthcare disparities, who live in, in, in housing conditions that aren't right, who don't eat, right. what work, work should that money be directed, some of it, besides in individual hands? I think Four to the hands. communities who are already doing the work. Once again, we keep forgetting. We are a thriving people. Each of us sit here, I'm sure, each of us has a story about who helped get us here. And it's, and it's usually someone who's at the first one on the list to get those dollars. So we have to go into the communities and see who's doing the work and ask the communities that question, as opposed to the experts being the one to answer it. I think another piece. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Another piece to that: money doesn't solve problems. Um, information does. If money solved problems, then when people hit the lottery, they wouldn't end up back in bankruptcy. If 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 money solved the problem, it's not a lack of money. Money is a part of it. Oftentimes, it's a lack of information and how that information is provided in culturally responsive manners. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good point because I, they say information is power. And I think I'm hoping tonight we've been able to provide some information to, to people here in the Prince George's County around the country uh, that's going to help them do the right thing, make the decisions that's going to protect them and save their lives. Um, it's getting to that, as they say, to that time. I want to thank all of our themed guests, uh, Dr. Rita Stanley, Dr. Chris Purnell, Dr. Jacqueline Hill, Dr. Theopia Jackson, Dr. Maduka Nindozim, and Dr. Masika Jordan. Uh, thank all of you. Bowie State, thanks all of you for being here this evening. I could go another hour and a half or two. There's so much information to cover, right? There's so much to cover. So this has been good. And uh, we're going to close out this evening. We're going to bring back our our esteemed president, um, Dr. Amita Bro. Looks like we do not have Dr. Bro, but we do have a fantastic Bowie State video. Shall we go to that? We're gonna go to that right now. And again, thank, we wanna thank everyone who's, who's watched this. Hopefully we'll be back with more. Thank you from Bowie State. Bold. It begins in your soul. It moves you, empowers you. It comes from shared knowledge, from community. Bold is born at Bowie State University. It's how we prepare students to break barriers and change the world. It's an affordable, world-class education focused on nurturing those ready to take charge. So bring your bold. Visit Bowie State University today, on campus or online. Bowie State University. Taking tomorrow boldly.